Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel. This is the title of a book that was just translated in Italian for Adelphi this year, and it was the winner of the Merck Award for Literature and Science. His author, Carl Safina, is here with us today uh, from Long Island, New York, to discuss his last work. So, uh, his book uh, is like a travel notebook, I would say. It is a, a journey across animal behavior and a tentative journey inside animal minds, uh, feelings and emotions. And like every journey, this one starts from a certain place and uh, it leaves something behind. And what is left behind is man as the measure of all things, as uh, Protagoras would say. So let's forget for a minute about man and let's focus on, on what it means to be something other than human. And this, of course, means entering a very complex ground. Back in 1974, uh, a philosopher, Thomas Nagel, wrote a paper entitled What it means to be a bat. Sorry, what is it what is like to be a bat? And he asked whether uh, it is possible to get access to other animals' minds, other animals' mental states, uh, how they feel, what they feel, what kind of intelligence they have, are they conscious or not? So the main character of this books are not uh, of this book by Carl Safina are not bats but elephants uh, in Amboseli Park, for example, in Kenya are wolves in uh, the Yellowstone Park, and killer waves um, and cetaceans more in general in Northwest Pacific. So uh, Carl, um, I would like uh, to ask you what is it like to be an elephant, for example. Oh, to be an elephant is to, uh, well, it depends if you're a male or a female elephant, it's a little bit different. Um, but to be an elephant, if you're a female, means to live in a family group with um, your mother and your sisters and everybody's babies. If, um, if you're a male, then when you get to be a teenager, you start to wander away from your family and eventually you meet up with other males and you, you live a life that is um, more with other males or or wandering around alone. But with the females, it's, uh, it's a very close, very family-oriented life, um, a lot of mutual support. The, the individuals mean a lot to each other. They are always looking for each other, calling to each other, making sure everybody's okay helping the babies if they get into any kind of trouble. Um, it's, a, it's actually a really beautiful life. If you start to look at it for a few weeks, uh, as I did, it starts to seem like maybe they have a, a better, more peaceful, more enjoyable, more supportive experience of life than many human beings do. So it's really, uh, to be an elephant is, is really quite a beautiful thing most of the time, I would say. And when, when uh, uh, you try to uh, enter this field of uh, animal minds, uh, I would say that um, you are unafraid uh, to challenge uh, scientific orthodoxy and uh, academic papers, uh, in particular uh, those concerned with comparative cognition and uh, philosophy of mind, for example. Uh, let's take, for example, theory of mind, which is the ability to attribute mental states, uh, beliefs, intents, desires, emotions and knowledge to oneself and to others. So uh, scientists uh, are generally quite cautious in attributing this capacity to animals other than humans, because they say we lack strong evidence for stating this. But your position on uh, theory of mind is uh, different, I would say, maybe more inclusive. Is it correct? Um, that is correct. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. One is that I am a scientist. So um, when you say scientists say this, but I say that, well, I, I am a scientist saying what I say. And in science, there really is not supposed to be orthodoxy. You're supposed to believe the evidence and your beliefs uh, and understandings are supposed to improve as you have more evidence, better evidence, uh, deeper evidence. All, all of these things should affect your understanding. You're not supposed to say, well, 
this is what it is, and that's the end of that. Um, you're supposed to say, oh, if there's new evidence that shows something a little different or 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 very different, then uh, if it's good evidence, then that's what that improves our understanding. Or orthodoxy is. Is, is not really for science it's more for religion or uh, or other other kinds of beliefs that are not evidence based but science is based on evidence so um, uh, yes but my my sense of um, the theory of mind capabilities of non-humans is uh, I would say is more inclusive and broader than it is for many scientists who work on this issue by doing laboratory experiments. Most field scientists, and, and I'm mainly a field ecologist, mo most of the field ecologists that I talk to or I work with or I visit in the field like I was doing when writing this book, they, they see what animals do every day in their real context and they understand that animals understand many things about their context. So theory of mind the, the the most basic, easiest definition of theory of mind is you understand that another can understand something and maybe have a different agenda than you do, right? So you don't assume that everybody sees what you see or thinks what you think. And if you watch any animal, um, certainly any vertebrate animal, um, what you see is that they understand that a predator has a different agenda than they do. Their agenda is stay away from the predator. The predator's agenda is catching them. They, they can tell the difference between a predator that is hunting and one that is just walking across from one point to another. Um, they, they know where things might be dangerous, that they need to be extra cautious or, or maybe even avoid. They, they understand, or, or when they're facing potential rivals or, um, or potential mates or um, many other individuals in, in basic situations. And there are not that many basic situations. It's, you know, it mainly has to do with food or movement or mating or predation and uh, what you see is that they understand that others can have a different agenda than they do and they have to either do something to get their attention or to avoid their attention um, if you have them in a cage and you're just giving them experiments and tests you, you don't see what they normally do you see what they do under very special circumstances and some experiments are very well designed and very insightful, and some of them are very poorly designed and can't really show you much. Of course, when I was saying scientist, I was referring to those uh, studying comparative cognition, which is a, a very uh, specific domain. I was not uh, uh, referring to scientists and science in general. But uh, going back to uh, theory of mind, maybe we uh, could say that uh, a problem with this uh, uh, trait is that it is uh, specifically defined as a human trait. And so uh, the operation of looking for a human trait in animals, maybe this is not necessarily a good one. Maybe this is what uh, you argue in your book, if I get it uh, correctly. So instead of looking for human cognitive traits in animals, uh, we should look for animal cognitive traits in animals. Uh, otherwise, well, we are committing humans, Protagoras humans mistake. Are Humans are animals, so any, any trait we have is an animal trait. An interesting question becomes, how many of the, of the traits and capabilities that we have are shared? Another interesting question is, what are their various kinds of animals, what are their special traits and abilities that we don't have? Like sonar, for instance, which is a huge part of the life of uh, dolphins and sperm whales. Um, so that is, um, you know, that's part of what I'm interested in. Theory of mind was first suggested for monkeys and it quickly got sort of, um, taken over by people who said, no, 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 no. It, 
only humans can do those things. But it, but, but those things, understanding that others have different agendas, was first observed in monkeys and was first given the term theory of mind by st somebody studying monkeys. So um, it, it's a it, it's um, it's a little odd that that the term kind of got not just used to apply to people because people certainly have theory of mind, but that some people said, no, only humans have this trait, which was first observed in monkeys. Yes, absolutely. And uh, mm, I would like to ask you, what is uh, then your uh, position about uh, mind in nature? So every living being uh, in the animal kingdom uh, has a mind, we can say. But do you think uh, that every living being, at least in the animal kingdom, shares basically the same kind of mind or that each living being has a mind, uh, but each one has a different kind of mind? Well, OK, so most of these questions and most of these words, um, they all open different cans of worms. And uh, it's good to talk about these things. I, I find it interesting anyway. So um, first of all, everything in the living world is on a range. There are not really very sharp categories where you could say, um, you know, this has a mind, this has no mind. Usually it's, it's more like how much mind does this have compared to that one? Everything is on a range. And um, I am not convinced that all living things have a mind. The, the part of your brain that is aware of things around it, that, that considers things around it, I would say that that is your mind. Um, I think probably all vertebrates have a mind to, a very, to various extent. I think that... Um, Octopuses seem to have a mind. I'm, I'm not sure about insects. I, I would say insects are, they seem conscious, or some of them certainly seem conscious. The first book about animal awareness talked a lot about bees, for instance. Um, they do seem to have a felt experience and seem to have an awareness of certain things. Um, when you get down to things like worms, which are certainly animals, barnacles are animals, even um, corals and sponges are animals, I, I don't think they have a mind. Some of them do not even have a central nerve system. So I, I wouldn't say that I believe everything has a mind. But I think that um, uh, the more like us animals are, in other words, the, the, the vertebrates, and the more that we see in their behavior that they make choices and that they discriminate, like octopuses choose things, they use tools, they can tell the difference among different people. Some people are familiar and they know them and they like them, some people they don't like, octopuses show that. So what I say is that you can you can see the brain, that's a physical thing, but you cannot see the mind, but you can see evidence of the mind in the logic of behaviors. So if animals are acting logically, if they look like they're making choices and evaluating things, if they look like they have a wide range of different recognitions, knowing who individuals are, who strangers are, knowing where they are when they get there, for instance, our dogs, when we take them to different familiar places, they know exactly where they are. They do one thing at one place. We go to certain beaches, for instance, or different people's homes. They, they, they know where they're supposed to run or when they're supposed to get out of the car, what they do at this place, what we do at that place, what direction we're going to go when we get to this particular beach versus that one. They know all this stuff. So um, that is evidence of their, of their mind. When when a stranger appears and they want to be very defensive until they see me say, hello, how are you? 
and I say to them, they're okay, then, then they relax. That's evidence of their mind. So that's how I think about it. And yes, I think that not only do different species have, have their own kinds of minds, but, uh, you know, the, the behavior of humans is often very, very perplexing. I, I don't know what it's like to be some of the people that I interact with, some of the people in my neighborhood who hold such strong views that I completely do not share with them that have to do with things like uh, politics or empathy or how they feel about um, immigrants or or religious beliefs or things like that. I, I, I find some people very, very odd. I find a lot of people very odd. I don't know what it's like to be them. I, when, I, when I feel love for my, my wife or my child or whatever, I don't know if uh, other people down the block who have a child feel their love in the same way. And uh, I had to yeah. shut my phone off. Yeah, sure, no problem. And in fact, this book is also is also a story about uh, about uh, humans and how we perceive ourselves. Because uh, as we started this conversation with the metaphor of the journey, every journey uh, at the end uh, uh, comes back home. And so after we come back home and we see what we left there. And at the beginning of this uh, conversation, we left there. Uh, what it means to be human and so we collected a lot of uh, experience uh, of this beautiful diversity reading uh, your book and uh, listening to your uh, words here in this conversation and now we go back to us and we look at us and what do we see uh, having learned all these uh, things all these different things yeah well um, that's for everybody to think about I would say it's not it's not for me to tell you or anybody who's read the book what to think or how to feel. <laughs> I mean, the book is about what animals think and feel, but I don't want to tell you how to think or feel. I, I will say that to me, what I've learned is that we live on a planet that is truly miraculous. And one very unexpected thing that I brought away from my whole experience of all the, all the research, all the travel, all the watching of animals, all the reading hundreds of scientific studies and uh, thinking about all this is the limits of human intelligence uh, have really come out to me in a way that I never really felt so so much before but to understand the miraculous planet that we live on with all of the mind-boggling diversity and beauty and how so few people really appreciate where we are and who we are here with all these other co-voyagers of life um, totally dismissed by many people often often destroyed wholesale um, either because we just don't think about them and don't care or because we are actually trying to destroy them wholesale um, that's a it's an unbelievably unthinking, unwise, and brutal approach to life that the human species is exerting in the world. And um, I wasn't looking for that at all. It just kept, it kept making its own appearance and, and, building, um, and building that case and that understanding for me. So I would say two things, the, the miraculous living planet that we're on with all of these extraordinary beings who want to stay alive, who value their lives, and, uh, and the humans who don't seem to value life very much at all, or, or understand that we are on a, an incredibly unique and wondrous planet. Those things. Thank you very much, Carl Safina, for your wise words, and uh, thank you for your beautiful book. Well, I, I want to thank, thank you very much for having me on and spending your time with me. I, I, I really appreciate it, okay? So, thank you. My pleasure, certainly. <laughs>